welcome back. Welcome to our afternoon, uh, late afternoon session, Eastern time, 3.30 to five o'clock. And uh, we have two talks in uh, this session and I'm delighted to have both of them here. And first we have Bridget McDermott from TD Bank in Ontario, Canada. And she's gonna talk about learning in a rapidly changing world, our journey from once and done to continuous learning. So she'll be talking about transforming training practices within TD Bank and I'm excited to learn all about that. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Bridget and you can go ahead and share your screen and start whenever it's convenient for you. All right, awesome. So welcome everyone. Thanks so much for joining me today. Excited to be here um, to share our journey from once and done to continuous learning. Um, to really prepare our colleagues for this rapidly changing world. And this actually all started pre-COVID. So I'm going to take you back to April 2019 with a focus on really, you know, getting to understand and know where we, we had to start with a clear objective. So before we do, just using that chat pod, I would love to get to know you. Where are you from and what do you do so that I can help frame up our story a little bit to address um, what it is that you're hoping to get out of this session today. So I'll watch for those to pop up. And as I do, you know, it all started with four key measures of success. So when we started, we had these four goals. It was around driving colleague engagement, decreasing absenteeism, and decreasing those short-term leaves and external attrition. And to do this, we really had to hit the books and go back to basics, researching across areas to dive deep into understanding the key drivers of these metrics. Our goal is to foster a culture of inspiring leaders who empower colleagues to continuously develop confidence and meet more customers' needs and while achieving their personal career goals with TD. So industry research and internal diagnostic show that we need to innovate and evolve our programs from this once and done way of learning into this continuous experience for growth and breadth if we wanted to retain that talent within the organization and also keep them coming back to work. So in doing so, we expected to see these, these metrics drive forward, but we had a long way to go to get there. And so for us, it all started with the TD colleague promise. And so this is our promise to any colleague joining TD. And at TD, we believe a more confident you means a stronger us. And we seek to help colleagues elevate themselves and their customers and the communities that they serve. And we set colleagues up for success by helping them build their skills, gain new perspectives in a rapidly changing world. And we strive to create a culture of care with our colleagues by helping them feel included, respected, and supported. But how does this connect to delivering against our vision? So when we take it a step further, the TD vision is to be the better bank. The mission is to enrich the lives of our customers, communities, and colleagues. And we do this through our shared commitments. So this is really the center of it all. And our colleague promise that guide our priorities and our actions. So each and every individual within our organization of, you know, 80, 90,000 strong, each play a very important role in ensuring the success of this vision. So the goal of our learning program is to create alignment and transparency across the organization to ensure that all of our teams and businesses are working together to achieve common goals. In doing so, we're targeting some of the key areas of our colleague engagement survey that will really help to you know, create that culture, but it all had to start with our leaders. So as we went down this journey, we strategically prioritized our leaders. So how did we get there? Well, this meant first staring down our current state and looking at what was broken. There was no sense in creating this innovative best-in-class learning program if the essence of what we were expecting our leaders to do was not aligned with that promise and our vision to be the better bank and our shared commitments. So what we learned as well as we started hitting the books is that what we were doing didn't necessarily align to the research and best practices that were identified either. So we started at the bottom and what we started with was launching consistent objectives across the organization. What this meant was we created transparency on what success looked like. So everyone was being evaluated against the same objectives and contributing to those individual goals. 
how we got there might look a little different for different levels within the organization. And that's where the core competency model came into play. And that included technical, business, and leadership competencies. We also evolved our scorecard. And so many of our colleagues within our organization had predominantly been evaluated based on KPI performance to date. Overseeing a North American contact center, one of the benefits of that is that every moment of every day of every interaction is recorded and measured and accounted for. And so we had to really think about what were we actually measuring our colleagues against? And so we evolved that scorecard in a way that aligned to meeting more customers' needs and really aligning to that commitment to being a better bank. Not only that, but we wanted to find the balance and not just measuring, you know, what we need to achieve, but how we're going to achieve it. And so with that, we streamlined reporting for absenteeism to better support the identification of trends and patterns and percentage of folks who were actually abusing the system. We invested in developing coaching capabilities to transition our leaders from telling colleagues how to improve versus asking them where they wanted to develop and arming them with the confidence to have tough performance and accountability conversations armed with the data and facts rather than feeling an emotion. All of this was really around that foundation that needed to be placed in an effort to onboard and continuously develop our people leaders to ensure everyone within our organization really, you know, was united to those common goals in a way that brought our desired culture and environment to life. The next step was to evolve our leadership programs for new to role leaders to ensure we sustained the behavioral change that we were looking to achieve. And so I'm gonna play for you just a video of how we really connected the dots to really drive forward that, that vision. Here we go. As a leader with TD, you're part of a united team. We create excellence together. Our vision is to be the better bank. Our purpose is to enrich the lives of our customers, communities, and colleagues. At TD, you will grow your skills, gain new perspectives, and create impact at work and in your community. How you promote an environment for success influences your team, your business, and TD. It all starts with our shared commitments. Think like a customer, act like an owner, execute with speed and impact, innovate with purpose, and develop our colleagues. Our shared commitments define our core beliefs and daily practices. They guide our behavior and direct our future growth, and they shape our unique inclusive culture. This vision will help set you apart as an innovative and trusted leader. And a better you is a better us. So this was really the vision that we were trying to achieve. The aspirational outcome was where we wanted to get to. And you can hear the story and the purposeful intention of each and every word within the script of that video that really was where we were trying to get to. But our per current program needed work. It did not align to the vision we were striving to achieve. And our current people leader program was archaic, out of date, and inconsistent across levels of leadership. It was also once and done. So when you take a look at our starting point, we have different levels of leaders within our organization. So group managers are leaders of leaders, team managers are leaders of individual contributors who directly interact with our customers. And then we had our new hire support system who are indirect leaders of new hire cohorts that are coming into the organization. But then we also have our strategic support leadership team as well, who oversees the strategic direction of our, of our North American contact center. And so what was interesting that was that for our group managers who were the leaders of leaders, they received zero formal training. They were handpicked as the cream of the crop from our team manager group as leaders of individual contributors and put into these leader of leaders roles, sometimes with a span of control of up to 100 and given no formal training in how to be successful in that new world. Our team managers received 40 hours of virtual instructor-led training over the course of five consecutive days where they were expected to come out and be proficient in over 80 skills and topics within those five days. They were then, much like the picture depicts, 
left to either, you know, continue to climb the summit or fall off the cliff into the depths of the fiery under underburn. And this learning was entirely front loaded with little support after delivery. Our new hire support roles who were accountable for the success of new to role colleagues received eight hours of independent reading. It was really not a great onboarding experience. So through reading, they were expected to then go and be proficient in the successful onboarding and proficiency development of these off the street or new to role frontline colleagues who were directly interacting with our customers. Then when we looked across our strategic support leaders, what they were given was, was significantly significant variability in what they received because it was purely based on the direction of their leader and what their leader provided. So as you can imagine, this created a really fragmented leadership team who was disconnected and a little confused on what success looked like. Not only that, but our learning programs were a bit in the dark ages. They didn't adhere to adult learning principles and they were really lackluster at best in the experience that they provided for these leaders. We had to change if we wanted to survive in this rapidly changing world around us. And remember, we started on this journey pre-COVID, so we had no idea what was coming down the road. We needed to flip our front-loaded classroom-based learning on its head and change the way we were teaching to maximize retention and speed to proficiency in a way that our next generation of leaders want to learn. If we could teach it in any other way other than the classroom, that's what we were going to do. And so, you know, when you take a look at it, you know, 85 per, up to 85% of what you learn in a traditional classroom is actually lost if you don't immediately apply it in practice. So, you know, think about making a meal or a recipe. This is the best depiction that I really have for it. If you went into the classroom to learn how to cook the meal, would you remember what you needed to do in the ingredients and the proportions and how to apply it when you got back home? Not likely, right? Most of us today will simply navigate to Pinterest or YouTube in our friendly mobile device and watch one of those 30 second videos of the, of, you know, the hands dropping the ingredients into a bowl and all of a sudden we're a master chef. The way that I really like to kind of depict this is, you know, you're going to go to Pinterest, you're going to access, you know, a recipe that has everything that you need, but you might skip over and just watch the hands dropping it into a bowl. But then you're actually going to go and make that item and you're going to sit down and you're going to discuss it with your family around what, what, or have an internal dialogue with yourself around what went well, what you might do differently, what you might want to change. And so this is what we call blended learning. This, this is probably not revolutionary to anyone that's, that's watching this, but the great thing about blended learning is it's a combination of synchronous and asynchronous learning. Now, remember we started this pre-pandemic, so nobody knew what these terms meant when I was trying to sell this vision to a bunch of C-suite executives. But what was amazing about it is that when we dumbed it down and really put it into perspective, it really made good sense that they were willing to make this investment. Sorry about that. And so what we call this is, you know, a combination of independent and, and social experiences. And we like to lay it out as tell, show, do, review. So in the example of the recipe, the tell is that information that you need to be successful. That's the recipe. The show is that video that's demonstrating what success looks like. The do is you're actually making it. And then the review is either that internal dialogue or the, you know, sitting down with your team to have that or your, your table to have that dialogue. In designing in this way, we also successfully achieved the 70-20-10 model of development. So the 70-20-10 model is a guideline for the type of learning distribution that will ensure the most successful outcome, the most successful um, retention of knowledge, where 70% of that learning happens on the job through experiences that are productive and aligned to job accountabilities and expectations. This is key. You don't want it to be something that's completely irrelevant or doesn't resonate with the learner. It needs to connect the dots. 20% of that learning is done through social interaction, such as integrated coaching, focused coaching, and workshops that spark discussion and reflection or spark an, a new thought. 
you know, previously, a lot of our classroom learning would have fallen into the 10% formal. This is where learning is structured delivery um, in that it's very structured and it's, it's formal learning. So much of us would resonate this with e-learning or, you know, work uh, classroom based learning, et cetera. But we really purposefully tried to migrate. Again, remember, if we were going to teach it in any other way other than the classroom, that's what we were going to do. And so whenever there was an opportunity, we wanted to make sure that anything that was synchronous that needed to happen together was highly interactive and really narrowed in on that 20% social learning rather than that 10% formal learning. And so by creating these blended experiences, we were able to really conceptualize a, a progressive absorption of information in what we like to call microbursts. And these were small chunks of consumable learning that allows allows time in between to absorb and hear the message. And we did it strategically that, that our learners would actually hear the same message five to seven times in different ways aligned with change management practices, because that's what we were doing. We were changing behaviors of individuals in order to drive proficiency and success. A key component to this behavioral change and so why am I talking about all of this? What does it mean to you and how you can transform your learning organizations? Well, let's take a look because it all started with a skills diagnostic where we spent a good chunk of time really you know, identifying the skills, knowledge, and abilities our leaders needed to be successful and proficient in, in order to be what we deemed the next generation leader. We looked across the organization at an enterprise level, a business level, and a role level to see what it is that we actually expected our leaders to know. We developed a classification system to link back to our shared commitments, our competencies in everything that we do. So if there was something that we expected our leaders to be proficient in that we couldn't connect back to our shared commitments, our competencies, or our vision, we pulled it. It was not something that needed to be taught. And so we ended up with over 80 topics, skills, and accountabilities that we expected our leaders to be proficient in upon completion. And yet, remember, they were learning all of this in five days of learning if they were lucky. So something needed to change. So as we dove into the diagnostic, we really established a classification system. We looked at how each of these skills, topics, and accountabilities aligned to the shared commitments. We looked at the level of proficiency required for each level of leader because what a team manager needed might have been different than what a group manager needed versus what a capabilities coach needed. So each of our leaders needed a different amount of information, but we wanted to ensure that we were doing this smartly and thinking about scale across the broader audience. So we looked at all of the levels of proficiency and we tried to connect it. We connected it back to the behavioral anchors within our competency model. We evaluated learning objectives, modalities of learning and overall experience. And here's where we landed. So where we got to was we had nine different business functions that we were supporting. Six primary audiences for our frontline distribution leaders, three secondary audiences, um, for our, our other leaders that would consume this information, we had 180 days to get to proficiency. So this was key. What we were migrating away from was this once and done to a 180 day journey that would have peaks and valleys across the board. Connected to five shared commitments, 11 core competencies, 80 unique lessons, over 500 moments of learning across that 180 days. And I'm sure that number scares many of you, but I'm going to break it down. 17 modalities, at over 80 hours of structured learning, and over 60 on-the-job assignments that strategically connected in to their quarterly evaluations, their year-end rating, and their year-end incentive. So everything had purpose and intention. As we did it, the next step, the next step was to really spread it out um, over the course of in the meaning in a very meaningful way in order to make sure that we had that speed to proficiency. And so that's where where we got is is here. So let me introduce you to the People Leader Continuous Learning Program. 
Welcome to your TD People Leader onboarding experience. You are here because you have a desire to inspire others to excellence. Through this onboarding program, you'll develop confidence in your leadership skills. The curriculum is grounded in our shared commitments, competencies, and measures of success. Each learning module will help you develop specific competencies that will lead to improved performance. Your learning path has been thoughtfully and purposefully designed. You will be guided through an innovative series of instructor-led virtual trainings, web-based courses, and collaborative practice exercises. Your curriculum map will guide your six-month learning journey as you navigate through all the available resources. You own the learning journey. Your effort will shape your success and your people leader, your cohort, and your peers will support you every step of the way. Because a more confident you means a stronger us. Sounds inspiring, right? But what does this actually look like in practice? And so that video is the first video every single one of our leaders sees when they join the organization and start their learning program. And so what it looks like in practice is the learning was categorized into this classification system and we went through reverse engineering. So we looked at the unique topics, skills and accountabilities and determined the learner outcomes. We lined up the measures of success to ensure everything we we're teaching tied back to the behaviors of what that'd be. We determined what they needed to know, tell, what success looked like, show, opportunity to practice, do, and social opportunities to make meaning and review. If we take a look at one of our topics, which is quarterly check-ins, I'm sure most of you do some sort of an evaluation within your organizations. So our quarterly check-ins happen once a quarter, as it would be, and it's a chance to reflect back on your performance over the past quarter. So we start off with the tell, which is independent learning that is available on our intranet or um, that is available just for readily consumption. It's independent learning that provides the foundational theory, knowledge or information needed to really create understanding or discovery. This is the awareness content that's, and it's re, what's important to note here is all of this is actually repurposed in knowledge management for on-demand consumption. So again, thinking about scale, anything that we build for our learning programs, we build it in a way that it could be used for knowledge management down the road, especially when it's these less infrequent tasks that only happen once a quarter, because we want that information to be readily available on demand, not just for our new to role leaders, but also for our tenured leaders. So it creates a lot of savings down the road and you're only updating in one place. Then show. So show is where we have what success looks like. And we leverage technology, here we leverage technology-based solutions, video or e-learning, or, and for some topics, we also um, have observational learning here where they actually shadow or observe a peer. Do is really that practical learning, right? So this is on the job mirroring tasks that they're expected to be proficient in. For for this module, this meant completing a rating tool for each of the colleague, each of the leader's colleagues or direct reports and completing the distribution tools and then actually going into review, which is where they reviewed it with their, with their um, peers as well as their people leader. And review is all about that social, is about that human and social interaction that man, we're all craving it in this day and age. And this is done through roundtable discussions, check-ins and workshops, not through a talking head interaction like this one is today, where I'm at the front of the room talking to you. This is about you know, the facilitator doing 20% of the talking and the participant or the learner doing 80% of the interaction. And so, you know, we, in our curriculum, we actually rebranded this experience to social learning because we wanted to make that an impactful part of the program, making sure that participants knew it was an interaction. They were expected to participate. They weren't just gonna come and listen. Another example that we have in this one is our total compensation and incentive. So this only happens once a year. So it's a very infrequent task. 
And so what we were learning is that we actually had this gap even with our tenured colleagues in how to celebrate, how to articulate year-end ratings or how to articulate why people were getting the type of incentive that they were getting. So we really wanted to make sure that this particular module or chunk of learning was designed in a way that it could also be lifted off the shelf annually as a refresher for those tenured leaders who may not feel as confident in this approach or who maybe have taken on a new team or just needed to dust dust the dust off. So we followed the same methodology and approach and we made it relatable to everyone across the organization. And so as we work through this reverse engineering process, we established a library um, that would become our standard standard for methodology and for consistency moving forward as we continue to expand and scale this approach. So now thinking about like in the corporate world, we now have this beautiful catalog of learning that as we identify business problems or capability gaps or, or et cetera, we can simply just curate and repurpose this great learning that's been created. So we really try not to focus in on your onboarding experience or things of that nature. It's just simply about the skills you need to know. And so I mentioned the 17 different modalities. Well, here's a few of them. So this really became our lexicon of modalities as we started developing, thinking about that 70% hands-on experience, the 20% social learning or learning from others, and that 10% traditional and formal learning. So this ensured we were creating consistency across our program and creating the guiding principles for the future as we scale more broadly. In doing so, it really helped organize the curriculum map for each role, because remember, not everybody got everything. One of the goals of the program was really to create this feeling of customization, um, even though it wasn't customized. And so the best way I like to describe it is, you know, think about like an iTunes library dated. I know like who uses iTunes anymore. It's all like Spotify or Prime, Prime Music or whatever. But um, remember, I'm going to take you back in the day when it was an iTunes library and you had, you know, all of your songs in the background. And so you had, you know, your genres, think of that as modules, you had your artists, you had your songs, you had all these different ways that you could classify and you could actually curate playlists. So if you're working out, you would do one playlist. If you're trying to relax, you'd have a different playlist. Well, that's what we did with these skills, knowledge, abilities, and all of the assets that were in behind it. And so the outcome of that was this curriculum map. And I know some of you will go, whoa, that's scary. And and it is because it's a 180 day journey and becoming a leader within our organization is important and you're impactful and you're going to make, you're going to make an impact on our organization. So we want you to see what that journey is going to look like. And so you'll notice on the left hand side, that's where we have all of our shared commitments, as well as the performance objectives of the leader. And we also have the competencies that connect within that. The center portion, you'll notice that it's all in a circle and that's by design because it's supposed to be continuous. And as those milestones extend out and out and out, the circle gets bigger and bigger and bigger because your knowledge is getting bigger, your proficiency is getting bigger, your confidence is getting bigger. And then on the right-hand side is where you see an overview of the milestones and what you're expected to achieve as well as the key areas of that. So you'll see like day one is one hour and one and a half hours of learning, right? one and a half hours of learning, the rest of the time is really getting to know your team. And, you know, welcome to people leadership. That's what it's all about. Then you go to week two. This is around the people leader essentials. And so it progressively builds. What you're going to notice is analyzing data doesn't even show up till milestone four. And that's by design, because we want our leaders to really focus in on the foundation, the essence, connecting to our shared commitment, you know, feeling deeply connected to TD's vision, mission, and purpose. So it's all by design. We don't want them to jump in and start like tearing things up until they have a bit more um, depth and breadth of knowledge. But what does this look like to the learner? So when we, uh, when we first launched this off, we curated everything in a platform called, we call TD Thrive. It's actually by a vendor called Degreed. It's not an LMS system. It's, it's, it's 
it's a, a curation tool. So it, it doesn't house anything in it, but what it allows us to do is it allows us to purposefully and intentionally connect the dots. So remember how I said all of that tell information was repurposed for knowledge management? This is how we connect it all together. So this is our platform that pulls in everything from our intranet, pulls in from our LMS, pulls in from the open source content that is readily available. And we curate it in a thoughtful and purposeful way that allows to, pro to progressively build proficiency. So this, what this also allows us to do is you'll see those little blue dots that say completed is that it allows us to track the, the progress. That, so it's a, but it's only a starting point because it is a self-completion validation. We then also need to extract the, extract the reporting from our VILTs or our workshops that we have to see who showed up. We also do a cross-reference against completion reporting against the LMS to ensure that if they've marked a web-based training completed, it is actually completed within there. But it's a really great way to curate things and organize it in a way. And so this works not just for our onboarding, but also for our tenured leaders, where we I'm going to speak to you in a little bit later about how we've kind of swept the assets and repurposed some of this learning for targeted approach for our tenured leaders. But our programs are only as good as the people who are using them. And so we, what this meant was that we needed to create structure and accountability to ensure we were optimizing our programs. So one example of this in optimizing our program was that, as I mentioned, you know, we went from this 40 hours of VILT or, or structured um, instructor-led training into, um, you know, these workshops that were 60 to 90 minutes. There's 11 of them over the course of 180 days. And very early on, so since, since we launched January 25th, we actually learned very quickly that we had an accountability problem because many of our leaders were actually um, registering for these programs and not showing up. And so they would come, to, and not only that, but also people would come to the program and they actually didn't know how to interact in the social environment. It was so foreign to them because much of their training had been so like instructor led <coughs> or inst instructor sabotaged, I would say, that they didn't actually know how to get the most out of it and how to engage. And we were very strategic in the design of these workshops to ask thought provoking questions, to, ha to have them bring case studies in. Each of our workshops, we actually have a SME come in and participate in it. So it's not led by an L&D fa facilitator. If we're talking about holding colleagues accountable, HR is there to equip them with how to performance manage. If we're talking about scorecard, we actually have someone from our scorecard team there to help answer their questions. And so we were very intentional in the way that we designed these workshops to really maximize their seat time. But from January until April, we had 152 no-shows and that was pretty significant. What that meant was that 29% of all of our learners had at least one and 37% of that 29% were actually, actually had two or more. Some of our leaders actually missed four of these workshops. And we were like, for goodness sakes, we just invested all this money. We need to create accountability. So we introduced this no-show policy. The purpose of the no-show policy was not to nickel and dime our businesses and our organizations, but as a COE, we had invested significant money in this program, and we wanted to make sure people were showing up to get the most out of it. And so this was really around changing the behavior, not about making money. Our goal is to get the no-show to zero. So in our May results, we launched the no-show officially May 1st, and so we have our first month of results. And what's incredible is that it's the lowest amount of no-shows that we've had since the program launched. And we actually had a 45% reduction month over month, um, which was pretty incredible. So, and it's a nominal fee that we're charging. We're only charging $250 for, for a miss. But any of that money that we do generate, we're actually putting it into a pool so that 
as we maintain the program, we have this pocket of money that's available so that we can continuously enhance and develop the program. And so this was a really successful approach in, in what it is. But we also had some other good um, lessons learned. So as we rolled out this program, because it was so new, it was, um, it, it was challenging for our audience to consume it. And it was, we had some unintentional fails as we rolled out the program. And so we really took some time to listen and learn to our participants. And we held a number of focus groups, predominantly focused on the high adopters. So we wanted to hear from the people who actually took the program and, and went through it in what we could change and how we could evolve. And so what was really interesting was this milestone reporting that we had originally initiated on, again, around creating that sense of accountability was intended to support, but it felt like we were policing them. So we put this undue pressure on our learners. And the whole reason we had created this 180 day journey was so that we could eliminate some of that pressure and people could learn at their own pace. So we quickly revised that. The other thing that we learned was that our people leaders had no idea about the people leader guide that we had launched for them to leverage to support them through their new people leader um, going through the program, which highlighted what they were learning each week, how to celebrate them and all of that great stuff. So we had to do some remarketing of that. Also, we had ambassadors that were part of the program, and so we found that we could leverage them a bit differently in order to hold colleagues accountable, but offer that support rather than that feeling of policing. We also created some centralized tools like the examples on the left. So, for example, the welcome uh, email that we that we created for leaders to leverage to welcome their new colleague on day one, refreshing the intranet um, resources that were available. And but what was really cool was this voice of the learner, because though there were a few things that were broken, we really did learn that we were making such a huge impact on the success of our leaders. So what the most compelling um, piece of feedback that we got was I know where to go when I need something. I had no idea that much of this information existed. Now, this is important because for that first launch, January 25th, we actually backlogged any new people leader who was put into a role as of October 25th. So there was a backlog of leaders who had actually been in role for three months. And this was the feedback that they were giving us. They were like, holy jeepers, like I had no idea that half this stuff even existed. So that was fantastic. And we knew we were getting something right. Now I can tell you till I'm blue in the face, but why don't we take a moment so you can hear directly from some of our learners. The skills that I am learning through the People Leader Continuous Learning Journey will not only help me as a team manager, but are preparing me for future roles across TD. Ten people leaders who are looking to upskill their knowledge or want to refresh on any topic are able to access the content. It also means that colleagues looking to build their competencies and skills while preparing for a people leader role can also begin their learning as a career developmental opportunity. While I wasn't a new people manager coming into my role, I have learned a lot on how to develop and advance my skills that will help me become a better leader for my team. The PLCL program has web-based courses and collaborative practice experiences. I love that I get to complete 85% of the courses and attend the workshops at my own pace. My schedule can change very quickly. Being able to pick up my learning where I left off allows me to focus on urgent priorities as they arise without compromising my progress in the program. I enjoy the different learning methods, such as online LMS courses, watching TV2 videos, or on-the-job challenges. Through the Adobe Room set up with different examples and opportunities amongst other colleagues, we're able to have one-on-one -on -one or group discussions to basically identify ways in which they do things to apply what I can do for myself. With multimodal learning, everyone is guaranteed to have at least one of their learning preferences met. The curriculum, uh, there's an outline through this leadership journey, is thorough and allows me to take my time to understand exactly what it takes to be a, a leader from a broader aspect. I'm able to see my progress throughout the program, which helps keep me on track. This empowers me to work hard because I know everything I learn will align with my personal and professional development goals. Through the 
this leadership course, I'm going to continue to develop myself into a much more prominent leader. I'm proud to work for a company that has invested so many resources and so much time to the success of my career. I can already see the increased confidence of new managers in the USCC that have had the opportunity to participate in this program. So our learners were just loving this new approach to learning. They love the flexibility, the progression, and the mixture of learning. And through their feedback and learning more about what is working, we also learned how we could scale this more broadly for our tenured leaders. So originally, we launched it out to our new to role leaders, but then we started to get really innovative. And because we were moving away from this one size fits all approach to learning, we wanted to find a way to add additional value to the program for our tenured leaders. So not only did we make the full learning suite available to really um, uh, allow that pull approach to consumption of learning, but we created this, what we're calling the tenured leader booster shots. And so the tenured leader booster shots are a bi-monthly capability program that lifts and leverages our learning assets that we created from the continuous learning program and puts it in a curated pathway that specifically targets um, specific KPIs that have significant performance variability. And so each month, what we do is we do a quartile analysis of our team managers across the organization where we look at the, where the variability in performance is based on specific KPI targets. We then send the leaders a participant list that we recommend based on KPI performance, but they have an opportunity to adjust it because we know data is only a small portion of the puzzle. There could be other things that are going on that are contributing to that performance. And again, we only want to make put people through this program who will get the best benefit from it um, and who can leverage it in order to drive performance. So then we engage them. So we launched our productivity booster shot was the first one to go in February. And that was predominantly targeted around our AHT average handle time and adherence metric. Adherence is um, the colleague's ability to to adhere to their schedule. So taking breaks on time, showing up on time, um, things of that nature. So average handle time is really important within the contact center business because every moment of every day is accounted for. With the launch of the productivity booster shot, we saw significant productivity gains across the organization. We saw 13 second decrease within, um, within our businesses, which actually equates to millions of dollars with, with, of savings in productivity. We're in the process of wrapping up our LEI and we're just about to launch our call compliance. So this program will now become a BAU part of our organization um, as we go through and continue to evolve and target specific KPIs from those scorecard metrics. And so, you know, as I kind of bring it, we're wrapping up here, and I just want to share with you some of the successes that we've had. Remember, we launched this program January 25th. It started in, you know, April of 2019 as, the, as we built out the foundations of it. And the fact that we were able to deliver this, you know, really through the past year, in a state of chaos and change, working with a, a very difficult vendor um, is pretty incredible in what we were able to achieve. And so just sharing with you some of the highlights since our launch on uh, January 25th.
So even in our success videos, you can see how we continuously connect the dots to tie it all together. And so as we wrap up, here's kind of the, the actions to take um, within your organization. So really take the time to establish the goals of what you're looking to achieve. For us, it was really around, you know, creating comfort, connection, contribution, driving that capability and really creating that confidence. And this was all anchored in, of course, those measures of success that we were looking to achieve. But also really design with that purposeful intention, really tie it back to that vision, mission, or, you know, whatever is important to your organization, make sure everything connects back to that. If it doesn't connect back to that, it's not worth training because it's not going to live on or have the scalability that you're looking for. Tie it back to the objectives and measures of success. That reverse engineering activity was incredibly imperative to the success of this program so that we could really articulate the with them and the why and, and create that desire for our colleagues to engage and our leaders to engage. The skills diagnostic and classification system was key because we now use that as our lexicon because, because of the success of this program, we've now been awarded additional funding to take it to the next level and apply the same approach across all of our frontline colleagues across the organization. So we will now be stripping apart, you know, our frontline colleague programs for 27 different businesses, um, you know, impacting over 10,000 colleagues in the same approach. Make sure that you're, you're very purposeful in your modalities and purposeful in your intentional sequencing of training. Remove the need for a one-size-fits-all approach to make sure that you're really maximizing and taking advantage of every available moment that that colleague is learning. And create that program governance. Really make sure that there is that accountability, that consistency, that feedback loop that's happening. Um, and, you know, don't take it personal because we literally went from the dark ages to best in class. And there was a huge shock to the system and to the organization. But now that we're six months into the program, we're really starting to see those results. And I'm really excited as we start to evaluate that first cohort who went through it will now be tying, you know, the high, medium and low adopters against their KPI performance in order to really qualitate um, what it is that we've achieved here and to validate the outcome assurance of the business case that was brought forward for this investment. So I hope you've enjoyed hearing our journey. I've left some time for questions. Um, if you're interested in hearing, uh, if you want to know anything more, um, but really appreciate your time and attention today as I've shared with you our story from a once and done to a continuous learning journey for our leaders. Fantastic, thank you. That's quite, it's quite a story, it's really quite a, what a change in the organization. And um, I think there'll be more questions about that. I know I'll have a couple. So there is one in the Q&A now, which is um, asking if you've ever thought about developing the emotion, look, doing something to develop the emotional intelligence of the leaders in the organization. Yeah, so we don't look at emotional intelligence as a standalone, right? It's baked into everything that we do. And so that's one of the unique approaches that we took to this is, you know, we don't train in a silo. So though we have these modules and the, these sectors, em, emotional intelligence is just something that's baked in across the board. We don't call it out as something special and different. Other questions? Um, all right, one, one from, from me, I'm just kind of curious. I think you may have mentioned this a little bit, but so you went from zero to like something really, you know, substantial. How long did it take you to make this transformation? I mentioned you rolled out in January, but how long did the transformation take? So from the time we signed the contract with the vendor to the time we delivered was eight months. Okay. Okay. Well, that's, during, that's, during COVID. That's a lot in eight months. Yeah, that's quite a lot <laughs> during eight months. <laughs> there was a lot like, of heroics, David. There was a lot of heroics to meet I, that I, time. I can imagine. I can imagine. Um, yeah, absolutely. So I do, have another, I do have another question from the Q&A, which is, what do you identify as the biggest roadblock in overcoming the transformation from one and done to continuous training. So what was the biggest roadblock that you felt you overcame during this time? That's the question. For the yeah, so that's a great question, David. So I know you asked how long did it take? So from the vendor signing to delivery to, to the first phase of delivery was eight months, but there was 
there was 18 months of trying to get the, the C-suite executives to make the investment. So for us, this was a $1.3 million investment. That's what it was. And there was lots of debate about why we would target our people leaders first, rather than going to our front lines who directly interact with our customers. And for many reasons, this was the right thing to do because it was a smaller scale than our front lines. But also, if we didn't have our leaders buying into this, this way of doing things, then our colleagues would never be successful either. So that was literally like a six month debate before we got the approval to make this investment. So I would say the C-suite executives who didn't understand the asynchronous versus synchronous and the impact of independent learning. Um, now that quickly changed once COVID hit, I'm not going to lie, like COVID was the best thing that could have happened for the strategy. Um, so that was our biggest challenge was just getting the C-suite um, to really see the value of the investment, because this is something that is hard to put dollars and cents against on the ROI of it. Um, but we have successfully done that in our business casing. And we had to reframe the story to speak in their language and the way that they wanted to hear it. And I said, was, it, was there any resistance from people in, you know, within L&D who, you know, have done things a certain way for a long time, and this is a really different way to do things? Yeah, most definitely. So this is the interesting thing. So I'm, I'm, so as the, I, I'm in the business. So our, our world, the end to end journey was actually a new creation. So this world just started in April of 2019. Prior to that, you know, our L and D partners and our HR partners didn't have a lot of governance or structure that they had to adhere to when interacting with our business. We supported five different pillars of organizations. And so they, they would take their direction directly from the vice presidents of each of those pillars. And so creating this centralized, I kind of became the gatekeeper and the strategy evolver of what it was we were going to do. And so there was lots, it probably took us like a good six to eight months, David, to, to understand who plays in the sandbox and who has what role. Um, and so as a strategy owner, you know, I was accountable for the strategy, the vision, making sure the business was ready to adopt it, making sure that we had the funding to support it. Our L&D partners really led that, that um, vendor evaluation, vendor selection process. And that's where we had to really start transitioning their, their way of thinking because we weren't going to take a vendor who had only ever done VILT. Like we were looking for a partner in innovation that could help move us forward. And they didn't have any preferred vendors that did that transparently. So we had to go out to the RFP process to bring new vendors in. Um, and so they, but we really got into a great place, David, where they managed that relationship. And we had a number of challenges with the vendor that we selected and because we had that six months of, you know, storming phase of change, they really went for bat for us as an organization to make sure that the, the vendor was held accountable um, in order to help us get there. And even to the point where, you know, there's aspects that weren't perfect. Our goal was to get it to 80% because our vendor had just failed us so badly. And so the goal was to get it to 80% and our L&D partners were right ready. We're going through our first round of maintenance already now in order to get it right. So we went through that storming phase, but we were able to work through that, define clear lines in the sand as to who's accountable for what, and really applied the practice of uniting all of us to common goals. We just each had a different place to play within that. So we were really a united front in what we were trying to achieve. Oh, it's great. Now, it's quite an experience that you've had. Um, do you think at this point might be a little bit too early to tell, but do you, can you tell already that the learning culture in the organization has, has changed? Yeah, so I'll share with you this, this little tidbit. So I, I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, we have our annual engagement survey that happens across and traditionally the North American Contact Center, we score well, but you know, there's opportunity. This year in the, so we did, when we did the survey last September, um, you know, after the most chaotic and archaic year of migrating 8,000 people to work from home, because of the program and, and, you know, the structure and the changes we had put in place, 
we actually had some of the highest um, scores across the organization in that engagement survey. Um, and not only that, we've just recently done a mini pulse and we continue to go up in our scores versus the rest of the organization that is kind of remaining flat or having incremental increases. So it's definitely making an impact on those engagement pieces um, across the organization. Great. Anything else? Oh, we got just a couple minutes left. Are there any other questions? And then I know, I mean, what, you know, I know you had that last slide. We kind of talked about what to do, you know, within org another organization. But, you know, if you had to sort of boil it down to a couple of big takeaways from your experience that people could, you know, really, really focus on, you know, if people had to leave with two things today or three, what, what would those be from your, you know, from this experience that you've done so much in such a short time and, and really just change the entire feel of learning in the organization? If you had, like, honestly, look outside your four walls. Number one, like, had we not done that, that industry research across Gallup and Gartner and Brendan Hall and everything that was like out there to inform the drivers of, uh, so I guess the second one would be identify the measures that you're trying to move. Like, that's the number one thing. But then look outside the four walls to truly understand what others are doing. Right. And, and then once you have, where you want to go, persevere. And I can't tell you how many times I repackaged and told the same story, but in a different way to appeal to the different audiences who are making the investment in this. And so persevere and stay curious and reapproach in terms that your investors can understand. Um, because that was a really big learning because though I'm, I'm a, a learning expert and in you know, an innovator and purpose, you know, my boomer investors were not as familiar with these new approaches. And so I had to make sure that I was translating into terms that they could really understand and appreciate. Yeah, I can imagine that was, yeah, that's, those are, those are definitely big, big things to accomplish. And um, it's really quite a, quite a, a change that you were able to create in the organization. Um, looking ahead, so now that you've kind of made this transformation of the things that you see as kind of your you know, big next steps, your big goals, you know, I'm probably take a break and, you know, rest for a little bit, although I guess you've had a few months of seeing us. We are off. resting. No, we're not, we're <laughs> okay. not resting, David. We're right into the next thing. So we're, right. already, uh, we're already in the process of applying this practice to our frontline colleagues. Um, so we have a new vendor engaged, are in the process of developing what we call our universal content. Um, so the content that applies to everybody and we'll be progressing we will be going through a, this, this transformation will take four to five years um, to get to the end state because of the volume and magnitude of it. Um, in one of our businesses alone, we expect our colleagues to be proficient in 181 products and services. Um, and so that's going to be a bigger fish to fry as we start to apply these same methodologies to our frontline colleague programs that are 100% VILT today. Yeah, no, that's quite it. When you, when you do that, one last question. So when you do that, how much, how much of the work, as much you know, in terms of, of the roles, boils down to what you do with your internal team versus what you're relying on an outside vendor to do? So a hundred percent of the a hundred percent of the content will be developed by our external vendor unless it already exists in our organization today. Um, the, our internal resources will do the knitting together, the tying together, the building the pathways, the creating the support structure, the measures of success, all of that. We only use a vendor to develop our multimedia um, content. All right. Well, good, good, good to hear all this. And um, really, it's been you know, quite a journey that you've had, as, as promised, and it's great to hear about it. So I think if there's nothing else we can... Um, wrap up with this and thank you so much for uh, spending the time with us and hopefully you can uh, you know, stick around through the rest of the week and uh, yeah, you guys really have something to be proud of. So really great to have you here.